Andy Stanley thinks asking if Democrats can be Christians is absurd. You can't possibly be a true Christian if you're a Democrat, which is absolutely absurd. Is it though? I'll answer that question today on Indie Thinker. Welcome to the show. My name is Reed Huberman. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Now, a quick question before we start today's show. Is annual climate change, also known as summer, making you long for a vacation? Well, you need to check out today's show's sponsor, our friends over at Sailor Ridge, where you can choose from multiple properties like the Lookout Tower overlooking miles of beautiful forest in the North Georgia Appalachians, or the Shiloh, where you can vacation like a hobbit in the Shire. Check out these unique vacation destinations and more by visiting our friends over at SailorRidgeTreesort.com. Just go to S-E-L-A-H-R-I-D-G-E-T-R-E-E-S-O-R-T.com. And when you do so, let them know that Indie Thinker sent you. The great Plato was asked a question, what is a man? And most people would have a hard time answering that. And indeed, it is a difficult question to answer succinctly. But Plato is a superior intellect, so he quickly retorted, man is a featherless biped. Now, deeply annoyed by that ridiculous response, Diogenes rightly took issue with it, went away, grabbed a chicken, pulled out all of its feathers, threw it in front of Plato, and then mocked him in front of the crowd of people and said, behold, a man. Now, obviously, a man is not a featherless biped. That's obvious. It doesn't even take much logic to kind of unearth the, the absurdity there. But Diogenes shows us that it is important to acknowledge absurdities and potentially even mock them relentlessly when we see them. That's because, as Voltaire said, if you can convince people of absurdities, you can convince them to commit atrocities. So when we see things that deserve to be mocked, I think we should mock them. And that's why today I want to bring up Andy Stanley to you. Not only is he a reliable source of disappointment in the evangelical movement, but, but also on this occasion, he says something that I think really deserves to be noted. This clip went viral. I think it's worth talking about. So let's check it out. You know what the messaging is now? This isn't in the corner. These are, if I named the people who are saying these things, you've heard of most of them. You've read some of their books. That you can't be a Christian and be a Democrat. You can't be, you can't possibly be a true Christian if you're a Democrat, which is absolutely absurd. But what's even more absurd is as conservative Christians, Republicans, demonize Democrats, all Democrats, and you can't possibly be a Christian, as as they demonize Democrats, they basically go against one of Jesus' primary teachings. Instead of loving their enemies, all these lost Democrats, they demonize them. They They make Democrats the enemy. And what did Jesus tell us to do with our enemies? Anybody remember? Yeah. So let me just say to those of you who are conservative politically like me, if you do that, stop it. You can disagree, but you don't write somebody off as bad and evil. Here's why. You think it's just, think it's just kind of funny. You study history. All that has to happen in any country is for a majority to decide a minority is evil. And once they're evil, they're cockroaches and they're rats. And once they're evil, the only thing to do with evil, you don't redeem evil. You don't, you know, you don't share your faith with evil. You get rid of evil. All right, there you have it. Beware conservatives because before long, you will become Nazis. You'll find yourself growing a very strange mustache. You'll throw on the jack boots. And just because you decry evil as evil, you will become what you fear most. Now, let's go ahead and just answer the question at the forefront here. Can a Democrat be a Christian or can Christians be Democrats? Well, I'll answer that succinctly and just say, generally speaking, yes, but it is as easy to be a Christian and a Democrat as it is to find a unicorn in the wild or maybe to find buried treasure in your backyard. Now, you may ask yourself, why is it implausible for a Christian to be a Democrat? Well, in one word, abortion. See, God kind of frowns upon the death of innocent babies, and the sixth commandment still kind of is in effect, thou shalt not kill. Now, it is a policy of the American left to kill babies. In fact, according to their official stance, they want abortions that are safe and legal and accessible. 
changing it from the old adage of safe, legal, and rare because they are so damned radical that they don't care how many babies are aborted. They just want to make sure that a woman has the fundamental right to choose because, of course, our founding fathers wanted people to be able to kill their babies. I mean, that's what the Constitution basically is all about. Now, this is not a policy position on the right. And they say this, the unborn child has a fundamental right to life which cannot be infringed. So now the question comes, can you show me the moral equivalency of the left-wing policy of infanticide on the right? So what is as morally egregious as that on the right? Take your time. Not too long though. We do need an answer. The, the real answer is this. Can you be a Democrat and be pro-life? Well, I guess, yes, you can. Uh, but you would be violating the tenets of the Democratic Party, which wants you to believe that a woman's right to choose is a fundamental right. But of course, screw the baby's fundamental rights because they don't have any. They're just simply a fetus. Because I only believe in science. All of this, and you start to dig a little bit further in the Democratic Party, and you realize they're the party of genital mutilation. They're the party of gay marriage. They're the party of a million other things that fly in the face of Christian scripture. And you realize there really is no moral equivalency here. That yes, the Republican Party has their issues, but when it comes to actually comparing these things, it's like apples and oranges. So. Hypothetically, you could call yourself a Democrat and be a Christian, but you would be violating all of the major tenets of the Democratic Party in doing so. Now, do absurd people exist? Yes, of course they do. So we have to make room for that. But by and large, if you're a thinking person and a moral person, if you're a Christian, in other words, then you would have to object to the evils of the Democratic Party and you would have to choose the other viable option in all elections. We'll get to more of that in a moment. But Andy Stanley says, hey, you conservatives, you know, when you say something is evil, ultimately, you're just going to erect gas chambers immediately and beware because now you're violating all of the tenets of, of scripture and all of the things that Jesus said about loving your enemies. Well, last time I checked, Jesus was acknowledging the fact that you have enemies by telling us to love our enemies. So we should be willing to acknowledge enemies. And this is what it means to demonize, to portray as evil or worthy of contempt and blame. So let me ask you a question. Do you think that mutilating a child's body parts because they had a feeling or were convinced by the culture that they are the opposite biological sex, that somehow uh, you should be able to chop off your body parts and you will magically turn into that other biological sex. Is that an idea that is worthy of contempt? Is that something that is deeply evil? If you have any question whatsoever about this, please let me enlighten you and show you what I guess can only be a, maybe a 11 year old, 12 year old boy who has been told that he is a girl. Wait, oh my God, wait, I need to get ready though. Even though I'm just gonna be in my, like, my room watching, like, I wanna Here, look bud. good for Casper the ghost. I'm just kidding, y'all. Here, <laughs> Thank I you. love you. Hmm. Okay, now we're gonna do blush. I'm just gonna do like the littlest dot because again, I'm at my house. But like, I still gotta get ready to eat my McDonald's. It's waiting on me. So if you like that kind of thing. Stop it, get some help. If you don't, it's time to demonize it so that we can actually really address these issues. And frankly, because of that and so much more, we recognize today that society needs a moral compass. Society needs a group of people who are willing to call out evil as evil. And who is the best suited for that? If you're a Christian, you know the answer to that. Furthermore, it is totally illogical to say that you cannot call something evil or that you shouldn't demonize. See, broken things don't get fixed if you don't identify them as broken. So you have to address things honestly in society, realize that things are broken in order to actually create a better society. It's totally illogical to think that we're gonna create a good society if we're not willing to acknowledge what evil is. And furthermore, it's not biblical to refuse to demonize. I don't know if you remember this guy, but Jesus actually demonized people. In fact, there's a point in time where he not only called people foxes and whitewashed tombs, but said, your father is not Abraham. Your father is the devil. Could it be? 
and you go around all the world trying to make converts and you make them twice the child of hell that you are. I mean, this is what Jesus said. I know you love the hippie. I know you love the sandals and the togas and all of that stuff and the long hair and the smelling of cannabis 24 seven. You smoke all the fucking weed. You do realize I die for your sins, right? Uh, I know that's the picture of Jesus that you have, but it just isn't the Bible Jesus that we see. The Bible Jesus said this, that the sick need a physician. That's why I came to heal those who are willing to acknowledge their sickness. You are not going to fix your problem until you admit that you have one. Jesus knew this and that's why the Bible is so clear. Now, who might be interested in trying to push away the fact that we actually have sicknesses or that there are evils in the world that need to be addressed? The only people I can think of are those who want that evil to continue. So it's the spider that says to the fly, come on, don't worry about it. Everything's just going to be fine. No, actually, Christians are called to militate against evil, and they're called to do so in the same way that Jesus did. Now, the final thing about this, and this kind of goes back to the fact of the illogicality of what uh, Andy Stanley just said, eventually we're going to have to get down to being honest and pragmatic about the fact that Christians in the world aren't going into ballot boxes to vote for Jesus. If we were you know, easy answer. We don't need any of the debates. We don't have to drone through any of the nonsense of listening to Joe Biden speak about things that have nothing to do with the question that he was answered, uh, that he was asked. Uh, no, if Jesus was running, the answer is clear. Since he is not, we basically have a binary system. Now, of course, you libertarians who enter in the comments section can say, well, what about us? But um, since you're never gonna win, I'm not interested in talking about you. I wanna be realistic here for a moment. I wanna talk about Democrats and Republicans. If you feel like, as a Christian, you have a civic duty to make the world a better place, then you might need to contemplate whether or not voting plays a part in that. And then when you do, you realize we have a binary system here between Republicans and Democrats. You may not like it, but it is the reality of what we're dealing with. So until we change that, let's just be honest about it. And you're gonna have to vote for one or the other party. And when you honestly line up things from a moral perspective, which again, which is what you're left with when you're not voting for Jesus, you have to look at things from a moral perspective and not necessarily from a theological perspective. And when you line up the party policies of Republicans and Democrats, the answer is clear. And it couldn't be more clear. A Christian's virtue lines up way closer to the Republican Party and more, more importantly to conservatism than it ever does with progressivism and the Democratic Party. That's why what Andy has to say is really troubling. Not only is it absurd, but it leads to this kind of myth of neutrality today. I'm not going to be on the right or the left. I'm just going to be right in the holy middle as though that existed. You remember what Mr. Miyagi said about the middle, don't you? Walk right side, safe. Walk left side, safe. Walk middle, sooner or later, get the squish just like grape. See, Miyagi knows. You got to pick a side. Now, I'm not saying that the sides always get Jesus right. I'm not saying that Jesus was a MAGA Republican. And I'm not saying, certainly, that Jesus was a pride flag waving leftist. And I understand that conservatives and, and liberals and progressives can, can get this wrong. Um, but what I am arguing is, is that if you're a real Christian, you shouldn't get wrong whether or not you should be a conservative or a liberal slash progressive. Because the answer is clear. When you line up again both of these parties in terms of their ethical and moral bona fides, it is clear which side you should be on. And the real problem with what Andy Stanley says here is not just that it's clear which side you should choose and that there is no myth of neutrality here, there is no moral equivalency here, uh, it, it also sidelines the evangelical fervor of Christians. When you tell somebody that it is shameful to acknowledge evil, what you're actually resigning them to is to just sit back and enjoy the world as it goes to hell. Now, Andy argues the opposite. He says, when you demonize or call something evil, then you don't want to win that thing. You just hate it and run away from it and eventually send it to a gas chamber. That's Andy's argument, but I think that there couldn't be anything further from the truth. It, it is only when you recognize that something is broken that you actually begin to fix it. And I don't know if you've noticed, but progressives in charge of culture are increasing the suicide rate, causing people to disrupt traffic with climate change activism, grooming children in public schools. Um, I don't know, creating racial animosity and tension that creates mostly fiery but 
uh, fiery but mostly peaceful protests and all of that. I don't know if you've noticed any of that, but it is clear that progressives are sending this world closer to hell and Christians are the answer to help redeem it. So if we are going to actually take up the mission that Jesus called us to, we're going to have to recognize this evil and then go into it and make a difference, not pretend it doesn't exist. But I can't help but wonder if some of this is very self-serving. I want to throw up a map right now of Buckhead, which is the most wealthy area of Atlanta where Andy Stanley's church is located. Now, as you can see from this map, very little of it to none of it even verges on red. There's a little bit of pink, but mostly straight up blue. That's because the vast amount of people that go to Andy's church, or at least we can say this, the vast amount of big money donors that go to Andy's church, they're liberals. So I can't help but wonder if he's pandering to them because he doesn't want to lose his base. Well, John Wesley said it best, the world is my parish, not just Buckhead. And we have an obligation not just to minister to those people, but we have an obligation to tell the truth no matter what form it comes in, and no matter if it alienates your big money liberal white donors. Again, I argue, how can the world find hope in Christ if they don't know they're sick? The first step in solving your problem is admitting you have one. If I am to be fair, to be charitable to Andy, I have to say this. Um, many of the things he says are flat out foolish and sinful, but I think I understand why he's saying them. Well, I don't understand why he said Al Mohler's Christianity is not his Christianity, but I do think I understand what Andy is doing. He's falling into the trap of many modern day pastors. He's sympathizing with the opposition in order to win them. This is Seeker Sensitive Church 101. Create a message around Christian objections, pander to the left, then shame your base, and all of a sudden you become a hero to the Republic. You gain a strange new respect from progressives, and you get to call yourself thoughtful. Well, here's the problem with that. It doesn't work. Cowardice never looks like thoughtfulness, no matter how much you polish it. That's not to say that it doesn't draw crowds. It will. It just won't do the mission of the church, which isn't about merely drawing crowds. Ask this guy. Andy Stanley and men like him have certainly created big churches, but they haven't created big Christians, disciples in other words. And I'm almost to the point, like Reagan said about the government, the bigger the state, the smaller the person. I'm almost to the point where I just want to say, the bigger the church, the smaller the Christian. But even if that's not true, I can say this, the weaker the message, the weaker the Christian. Stanley supporters out there are still living in denial on this, defending him, crying out for nuance, and saying that people who take him out of context are part of the problem. You just haven't understood him. Um, no, it's just that he's not fit for ministry, and it's time to be honest about that. To prove that, just look around. Andy and his friends have presided over the most catastrophic post-Christian shift in American history. Less people know the Bible today than in any other time. And just go to the church right down the street to, to prove that. And by the way, less Christians are going to the church down the street because we are living in one of the most post-Christian times in American history as far as church attendance is concerned. There's certainly some culpability on the shoulders of Stanley and others like him. The world needs truth tellers, not people who hold water for progressives. The pro-LGBTQ Christian knows deep down in their heart that they need a cure for their sickness, not an affirming pastor. The desire for someone to sympathize with you is part of that sickness, by the way. If you want others to heal you that are just as sick as you, well, then you don't really know how this goes. No, you want others who know the cure, truth tellers who can help you get out of your sickness to help you. You don't want shame-based arguments that keep us in darkness. And that's just what Andy did here. There's no defending it. The church has been offering palliatives to lost people who are dying and on their way to hell. That is the epitome of hate. The most sensitive thing you can do for the seeker is to put your selfish ego to the side and tell the truth for God's sake. Sure, police your tone, be respectful, and don't be an arrogant ass, but tell the truth because no one who ever loved someone lied to them care enough about a person to warn them from the path that leads to destruction. That may not be Republican v. Democrat, but one is sure as heck closer than the other. We will continue to drown in a sea of irrelevance until we finally develop leaders who are strong enough and honest enough to say just that. Only then can our message shine a light on a good society because we've decried evil. 
your civilization may not start by thanking you, but its survival sure as heaven depends on it. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Don't forget to check out our sponsors down below in the description of this podcast. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and go with God.